Hey everybody, welcome to the module one, topic two and three review for Osborne two. Um, today, we're gonna go through the review packet for the Algebra 2 test that covers polynomial key features, things like end behavior, degree, zeros, multiplicities, uh, as well as transformations, uh, just a bunch of stuff that you have to do with polynomials and graphs. And first of all, I just wanna thank you for joining me here. Hey, we learned, we did a, a little bit of statistics going as teachers of Algebra 2, and we saw that from the last test, the students who did their review had about 10 to 15 percent higher test scores across the board now obviously correlation does not imply causation but i don't think you're going to harm yourself by uh, watching this video i don't know how long it's going to take me but just know that each question is individually time stamped so if you're like oh i understand all of this except for this one part just go to that part of the video there will be a little bar at the bottom if you're on youtube that you can slick to or you know, slide to, or you can uh, go to the description. If you're on Teams watching this, there should be a description in the video that has a uh, little timestamp numbers and you just click it and it'll send you that part in the video. Okay, so if you have a specific question about a specific question, go to that part, don't sit through all of it. But if you really feel like you need a, a full rehashing of the material from the last month or so, uh, then grab some popcorn, grab your review, grab a pencil, uh, maybe Desmos, and we're good to go. Okay, so let's get started with question one. Okay, so question one and question two are similar. And this is a lot like the polynomial packet that we did with a little bit extra with relative maximums and minimums, okay? If you've done the Matthew workspace, uh, I don't remember which one it is, like 23 or something out of 25 um, in the uh, ex or searching for patterns module, then you've probably seen something really similar to this problem. Like you go through this entire problem in Mathia. Um, but if you just stick to the polynomial packet, I think we can do that as well. Okay, so here's the function that we have. Nice little curvy function that's going on. They actually don't give us an equation at all. Okay, so it's different from the polynomial packet in that we don't have to really classify any zeros or their multiplicities, um, because we don't necessarily know them. But we do have to figure out these other key features just from looking at the graph, okay? Um, and first things first is we have no scale to this graph, but we can go ahead and say that each one of these boxes is just one, right? I think that's easy for me. So every time I cross a box, I'm going up one in the x and up one in the y. So I guess this one would be negative one, right? So when we want to find this y-intercept, well, I can see that for the y-intercept, my graph crosses the y-axis right about there. And let's say that's at y equals one, so that's gonna be the point zero comma one, right? X is zero, Y is one. All right, so for degree. Now this one's interesting because when we had the polynomial packet and we were given just a problem that says, you know, with a factored form of an equation, you would just add up all the exponents to get the degree, right? Now we have to do a little bit more thought just to answer the degree for this problem, because we have to think about what the degree matters or what aspects of the degree matter visually on the graph, okay? Well, there's a couple of things. Number one is the end behavior, right? The end behavior is determined by degree a little bit. And as well, the degree had to do with the exponents from the factored form and the exponents of the factored form had to do with the zeros and specifically their multiplicities, right? So remember, and this is just a little bit of a review, when the zero had a multiplicity of one or three or five, an odd multiplicity, it would cross through the x-axis, right? So when I look at these points, I'm gonna take all of the points that I cross through, like here, 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 and here, right? And I can see that I'm crossing through here, I'm also crossing through here, I'm also crossing through here, I'm crossing through here, and I'm crossing through here. So I'm doing no bouncing whatsoever, which would imply that all my zeros have an odd multiplicity, okay? Well, using the rational roots theorem, um, it implies that the most amount of zeros that a polynomial can have is equal to its degree, 
okay? And if I'm crossing through all of them, that means that their multiplicity has to be something like one or maybe three or five or so on. But let's just say of simplicity, say that every time I cross through, I'm crossing through with a multiplicity of one, which would mean that the five times that I have a zero, each of them has a multiplicity of one. If I add up all of those, the one plus the one plus the one plus the one plus the one, plus the one I see that my degree is five. Okay, my degree is five. Now, theoretically, you know, this could be a higher degree function, but when we cross through an axis with a higher multiplicity, like for instance, I'm just gonna draw what happens if a multiplicity is three. Normally what you do is you do this little shimmy as you go through it, right? You do this little like curvature thing. In this case, I'm just gonna cross and straight through it, which would imply that all of the multiplicities are one, okay? Um, so to answer that, well, first of all, I got that by just taking all the different times I cross and adding up all the different multiplicities, which are basically the exponents from factored form, right? That's how I figured out the degree. And then I have to figure out, well, odd or even degree, five is an odd number, so this must be odd, okay? Now what I have to think about is the end behavior, the positive or negative leading coefficient, okay? How do I answer this? Well, I know that my graph right here is an odd degree function, okay? Now, if you look further down in the packet, I believe there's a section that talks about end behavior. It's right here, right? And we can see that as, if I have an odd degree function that looks something like this, that means that if I start at the bottom left and go to the top right, that means that my leading coefficient is positive, right? Which, if I go back to my original graph right here, oops, not this one, but this one, I can see that my graph starts at the bottom left and ends at the top right, which would mean it matches that one from the table, which means that the leading coefficient is positive, okay? I kinda wanna do another aside real quick to just talk about end behavior because Obviously, you're gonna have access, if you do this and use these notes, you're gonna have access to that chart as a review, right? But I wanna give you maybe, I would challenge you to, you know, figure out a better way to remember it, okay? So that's what I'm gonna talk about here, and here's how I remember it personally. If this doesn't make sense to you, then feel free to not remember it this way. But kind of like relating to our example we just did, where I was looking at the ways that I crossed through my zeros in their multiplicities, right? I just chose one, assuming you know each multiplicity was one because one is the simplest odd number, right? If I have an odd degree polynomial, the simplest odd degree polynomial is a degree one polynomial, right? Well, a degree one polynomial is just a line, right? It's just a linear function. It's something like y equals mx plus b or f of x equals ax plus b, right? And lines can only be two things. They can either have a positive slope, meaning they go up like this, or lines can have a negative slope, which means they go down like this. Well, hey, guess what? By looking at just these two lines, I can figure out the end behavior for any odd degree polynomial because any further or higher degree polynomial it's just a line with more squiggles, right? They end, they start and end at the same place, okay? Well, what this means is as I go, as x approaches negative infinity, which means I'm going as far left as I possibly can, right? This phrase right here, this just means in math words, left, look left, right? So as I look to the left side of my graph over here, I have to then analyze where is my line? Where's my function, right? F of X, that's what I want. And so we say as X approaches negative infinity, uh, F of X approaches what? Well, as I look to the left side, my graph is approaching down, right? It's going down. It's below the X axis, it's negative, which means as X goes to the left, F of X is going down f of x is approaching negative infinity, right? This just means down, okay? Vice versa, when I look at x going to the right, as x goes to positive infinity, well, that's just the right side of my graph, right? Over here. As x goes to the right, 
my function, my line is going up. So f of x is going to positive infinity. Let me write it in green so it matches. Okay, green represents the line here, right? My uh, my function f of x goes to positive infinity. Right? So as x goes to the left, f of x is going to negative infinity. It's down at the bottom left, and then as x goes to the right, that's what this means. Really means just go as far right as possible. My line is up top, which means that f of x goes to positive infinity. Okay, for the negative slope, right? And now this is a positive slope because the a value is positive. This one's a negative slope because the a value is negative. It's the opposite, right? As x approaches negative infinity or to the left, that means that f of x is approaching positive infinity. It's up top. And then as x approaches positive infinity, well, as I go to the right, f of x, my line, is going down, which means it's going to negative infinity. Okay. So it's all about this, this end behavior. I think people are getting confused on it, but it's really all about just looking at as far left as you can. Is your line up top or is it down low? If it's up top, it's going to infinity. If it's down low, it's going to negative infinity, right? And this is the case for every single odd degree function, okay? So how is this related to the problem? I know we just did this long aside. Well, it's gonna help me figure out what the positive, the value of my leading coefficient is, right? This line, like a line with the upward slope, well, this thing right here, if I draw a straight line between end to end, I can see that it's a line with an upward slope. Sure, it's got more squiggles along the way, but really it's an odd degree polynomial with a positive leading coefficient, which means the end behavior is start at the bottom left and work your way up to the top right. All right, cool. So now we have domain and range. Domain and range. We've talked about this a lot in your previous other math classes. I know it's in Algebra 1. It's in every math class from this point forward. I promise. Domain and range is kind of important. Okay. And all it is, all it is, is it's talking about what are the possible x values. Where does your graph exist left to right? Okay, and then range is the same thing, except it's all the possible y values. Where does your line, your graph exist? Down and up, down and up, or down to up, bottom to top, okay? Well, here's the thing, right? If I look as far left as I possibly can, if I imagine I drew this line this has an arrow, right? Which means it goes on forever. Like this line extends to the far left side of the universe. If I keep extending this out, eventually I'm heading downwards, right? I'm heading down into the left, which means eventually, eventually I'm gonna head all the way left. If I give this enough time, it will end all the way on the left side of the universe, right? Which means that the lowest possible value left to right is negative infinity, right? I can make it all the way over to the left side of the graph, it will continue going down, okay? Same thing on the right, if I continue drawing this up, right, maybe my line won't look like that, but if I continue drawing this, it might get very, 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 very minuscule change, but I will keep on going to the right. This will go on to the right forever, which means that I'm gonna hit my line, if I extend it out as long as I possibly could, would go all the way from the left side of the universe, the left side of the graph, to as far right as I can possibly go to positive infinity, right? Which means it goes everywhere. It hits every single number, which means it hits all real numbers, okay? It hits everything, it hits all real numbers. What about the range, okay? The range, well, the range, is the same thing except you start at the bottom and you go to the top, okay? Well, if I extend these lines out forever, these arrows are pointing down and up, meaning these lines will extend as far down as I can possibly go, all the way to negative infinity in the y direction, and they'll also extend up all the way to positive infinity in the y direction, which means the range hits everything as well. It's also all real numbers. Nice, okay. 
The domain is left to right. If you imagine drawing those arrows and extending the graph out, even though it's so minuscule, this line is still going to the left, meaning it will eventually hit negative infinity on in the x, right? And this line is still going to the right, which means it'll eventually hit positive infinity in the x. Domain, and in fact, your domain for all of these functions will be all real numbers, okay? Your range might differ, but for in this case, I can go super low, I can go all the way to negative infinity, I can also go all the way to positive infinity, it means the range is all real numbers. You might have seen this symbol as well, that is the symbol that stands for the real numbers. So you just say it's all real numbers. Okay, cool. Next up, I'm gonna erase all this and now we got two more, well, a couple more things to do, relative minimums and relative maximums. All right, so relative minimums and relative maximums. Well, here we have to look at all the different times that I change directions, right? Every single time that I have an extrema, right? You've probably seen this word, extrema. And the way that I remember extrema is if I had a little guy, let's say, I don't know, this guy right here, let's call him, hmm, he's on a skateboard. Uh, let's give him a name. Let's give him a name of, I don't know, Tony, <laughs> anyway. Let's say that this guy was gonna skateboard his way across my graph. That'd be pretty extreme, right? Well, eventually, because of just how this graph looks, he would get all the way up until this point, and if he hits this little hump, he's gonna have to like fly in the air, right? And he's probably gonna do a cool trick. Oh. Which means that he did something extreme, right? If Tony is skateboarding across my graph and he hits a hump or a lump or whatever, and he does a trick, that means he's hit an extrema and it's a relative maximum, a relative minimum, or an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum. Um, did you know that X Games is actually named after extrema um, on a graph? That's a lie, I made that up. I lied for attention, like LeBron James. Anyway. Um, the relative maximum and relative minimums are just any point that you're going to change direction, right? You're going from negative or going up to down to up to down or something like this. And so the ones that I see are right here, right here, right here, and right here. Okay. And so what we have to do is just give those some points. Okay. Now, if I'm reaching the top of a hill, that means I'm reaching a maximum relatively, right? If I'm reaching the bottom of a valley, that means I'm reaching a minimum. So this one would then also be a max, and then this one would also be a min, right? So we got a max here, a min here, and a max here, and a min here. So for the relative max and the relative mins, we just gotta figure out what these points are, all right? Let's use a color. So I'll say, how about green for max, red for min. So we'll say that this one is a green, this one is a green, and then these two are reds, okay? So honestly, because I didn't give you a scale, you can kind of eyeball it. I would say that this is probably in the X, it's like negative one, two, three, four and a half. So let's say negative 4.5. My pen is too large for this. Let me make it smaller. Negative 4.5, let's say. Comma, the Y value, I would say, I don't know, this is probably like 0.2. Okay, so we'll say that that's that point, negative 4.5 comma 0.2. I just kind of eyeballed it. Uh, so the minimum here, that's a maximum, sorry. Maximum is negative 4.5 comma 0.2. And then we have another one, which is like right here. Um, and I would say that this one looks to be at the X value of negative 0.8, I guess, I don't know. Let's say negative 0.8 and the Y value is like 1.2. So then I would say negative 0.8 comma 1.2. Okay, I'm just kind of eyeballing it to be honest. Uh, they don't have to be exactly right. And then this one, really what we're asking when we see this is just figuring out which point is which, right? Which ones are the relative mins and relative max. Anyway, so this one I can see that it's a relative minimum because it's definitely not the lowest point in the graph, but um, 
it is, I have to erase Tony. It is relatively a small point because I've changed direction from going down to up, all right? I've reached a valley, which would mean to look at this point, the X value is like negative one, two point eight, maybe, I guess, negative 2.8 comma, uh, the Y value is like negative 0.1 or something. So let's say the relative minimum is negative 2.8 comma negative 0.1. And then this other relative min rather is down here. And this one looks to be at X is one, two and a half. So let's say 2.5 comma negative one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's a nice one. And then 2.5 comma five. All right. I know that was pretty extreme, but let's think about the re absolute maximums and minimums. Now, if we talked about this in class, it's kind of like the rectangle square thing where every absolute maximum is also a relative maximum, but not every relative maximum is the absolute, right? There can only be one absolute, and it is the lowest and highest possible points on your graph. Now, these graphs, this graph right here, extends down forever. This part up here extends up forever, which means these lines will continue to go down on the left and up on the right, right, forever, which means any maximum you would give, you could just keep going further. Any minimum you would give, you could just keep going further down. And so there's no clear point. There's no point that is certainly the lowest point because they extend up and down forever, which means there is no maximum, absolute maximum or absolute minimum. So we would say none, smiley face, or none, frowny face. Okay, depending if you're happy or sad, that kind of looks like a, that looks like not a word at all. Here, let's see none what am i doing oh here we go none cool all right Whew, what a problem now I, <laughs> I did take quite a while to explain every single part of that so i think this next one will be easier because we've done all that pre-work that ta tangent of the end behavior and stuff so let's just do the next problem uh if you're confused about this next one and you skip to part two I recommend watching part one because this one we really went into detail on, okay? So I bet we can figure this one out fairly easily. All right, so actually we're gonna have to go on another tangent. Dang it, because I realized the end behavior on this one. Okay, anyway, let's think about the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept right here, or no, I think I cross. Uh, where do I cross? Let's say I cross right there. So let's say that is at y is negative 1.5, which means my y-intercept would be at the point 0 comma negative 1.5, okay? And I just looked at the graph where it crossed the y-axis. Now the degree. The degree for this one is certainly more interesting. However, we can use the same tactic to sort of think about the zeros in their multiplicities, right? And so as I look at this graph, I can see that I cross through right here, I also cross through right here and right here, as well as cross through right here, okay? And using the same logic as the previous problem, the simplest degree or the simplest multiplicity that crosses through the zero is one, right? An odd degree multiplicity crosses through, the simplest odd number is one. So let's just say that each of these, for sake of simplicity, has a degree of one. That would mean if I add them all up, it's gonna be one plus one plus one plus one. Hey, that's a degree of four. Okay, it's a degree of four. Uh, and then four is an even number. Nice. So four is even, degree of four. Okay, next aside, just on end behavior real quick. Now we talked about odd degree. Let's talk about what happens if you have an even degree function, okay? And I think if you watch these and understand this, your end behavior problems will be solved. All right, so let's talk about the end behavior of a even degree function. Well, the simplest even degree function I can think of, well, it would be zero, zero is an even number, but that doesn't really help us. So the most relevant simple even degree polynomial is degree 
2, right? A degree 2 polynomial is just a parabola. It's like x squared, right? It's this whole pass unit we did. It was quadratics. That's all degrees 2 stuff. So let's draw the simplest parabolas I can think of. I can think of this one, and I can think of this one, right? And these are the only two ways that you can draw parabolas, at least for their end behavior, right? I mean, they could be wider or moved around and stuff, but they can either be facing up like a cup or down like a frown, right? And that has to do directly with their leading coefficient value. If it's up, that means A is positive. If it's down like a frown, well, you frown when you're negative, which means that your A value is negative, okay? So if you have an even degree function with a positive leading coefficient, then the end behaviors are as follows. As x goes to the left, as x approaches negative infinity, well, I have to look at the left side of my graph for that. I can see that my line is heading up, right? As x goes to the left, my line is going up, which means as f of x, or as x approaches negative infinity, my line f of x also, or actually approaches positive infinity, not also, it goes up. And then on the right side, as x approaches positive infinity, it goes to the right, if I look at the right side of my graph, I'm up here. I'm up top, which means f of x goes to positive infinity on that side as well. Okay. What's cool about the even degree functions is that they always have the same like f of x end behavior, right? If you go to the left and you go to the right, it'll end at the same place. The other way to do it though is if you're concave down, right? If your a is negative, which means as, sorry, someone's at the door. It was Amazon. Well, not Amazon. It was the Amazon delivery driver. Anyway, um, where was I? Oh yeah, if I'm concave down like a frown, meaning my A value is negative, if I look at the left side of my graph, meaning when X approaches negative infinity, I can see that I'm down at the bottom, which means that F of X is approaching negative infinity too. But then when I look at the right side of the graph, when X goes to positive infinity, my line is going down as well, which means F of X is once again going to negative infinity, okay? So the end behavior, um, it's going to just be the same as what a parabola was, right? For every even degree function, because a more complicated degree function is just a parabola with more squiggles, right? It looks like something like that, right? And so when I go back to my problem now from the previous page, I can see that this one is like a parabola, but with this inside sort of flipped, right? Kind of looks like a tooth. Okay, well, what that means is this is going up generally like a cup. And I can see that if I look to the left, I'm up top. If I look to the right, I'm up top, which means that my leading coefficient has to be positive. All right. Now, the same logic will apply for domain um, as the previous problem, right? If I extend these lines out forever, even though it, the increase is gradual, right? This one will keep on going left forever. This one will keep on going right forever, which means give it enough time to the left side and to the right side, it's gonna hit the infinities, I meaning it's gonna hit everything, right? This graph will continue going on to the left, the right forever. So the domain is all reals, all real numbers. However, the range for this one is different, right? Remember range is the lowest point to the highest point. And in this problem, I think I have a clear lowest point. It's happening like here, right? If I look at this line, there is no other part of my curve that exists below this, right? Which means that these two points have to be the lowest possible points. And it implies that our range is no longer everything, but a subset of everything, okay? And here's how we're going to classify that. First of all, we need to figure out what the y value is here. And it looks to be negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So this is at negative 6. Okay. Well, if negative 6 is my lowest possible point, that means that my range and all my y values on my graph, all my y values that exist are at or above negative 6, right? Well, we have a symbol in math for at or above, and we call it greater than or equal to, right? All the y values of my graph are above and at negative six, which means 
all y values, my range, is greater than or equal to negative six. Okay, that's definitely a mathia problem. You've definitely seen that one before, at least in algebra one as well. So if you're confused on that, you just got that welcome, right? Here's the lowest possible point. Everything in the y, all my y values are above that. Okay. Relative max and relative min, same process as last time. I'm just going to find every extreme point, right? Every extrema. Um, and if it's a minimum, let's mark it in red. So I'm heading down and I hit a valley right here. So that's going to be a minimum. And then I come up and there's a max right here. And then I work my way down and I have a minimum right there. And then I continue up and there's no other changes, right? So it looks to me that I am going to have two mins right here and right here uh, and one max. Now you just need to figure out, are they relative, absolute, both? Let's see, okay? So let's figure out where these points are. It turns out that this one's gonna be a nice point. It's negative one in the x, comma, we just found this was negative six. So that's that point. And then this one's gonna be, here's my axis, so one, two, three in the x, and also negative six in the y, all right? Now it's worth thinking about, are these relative minimums or absolute minimums? And looking at the range, we can see that there's no other points below negative six which means they certainly have to be absolute minimums. Negative one comma negative six is an absolute minimum, as well as three comma negative six. However, if I were to like zoom in on this picture, imagine I'm only looking at this section of the graph, right? You could still tell me that this is a minimum, and you could tell me that it's a relative minimum as well, right? If it's the lowest possible point, then it's also the lowest possible point in its area. So we also write our absolute minimums as relative minimums. So we're gonna say that this is both an absolute and a max, or sorry, an absolute and a relative. Both of these points are, okay? Now this point right here, this is a maximum, we determined that. However, if I look above it, there is more graph, right? There's more graph to be seen above it. So it's definitely not an absolute maximum. There's higher points than this. However, relatively speaking, it is a max, and it happens to be at the point one comma two. And so my relative maximum is at one comma two. Ooh, what a problem. What a set of problems. We can determine so much about a graph just by looking at it and knowing what it's asking, okay? Um, if you're still confused on some of this, I recommend going back through your polynomial packet giving uh, some of those a shot, maybe reading, going back through our notes from the past couple of days um, and just sort of thinking about what are the ways that I can look at a, a parabola, or not a parabola, just any polynomial and determine the important features of it, okay? Um, sometimes it's even worth just plugging random things into Desmos and just seeing what it does, and I think that might help, okay? Uh, anyway, on to the next set of questions. Question number three. Sorry if that was an abrupt cut. I, it's a new day. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new life. And I'm feeling good. All right, here we go. <clears throat> we are asked to write an equation in factored form and in standard form for the polynomial. All right. Well, factored form, I think, is easier to start with. And I think what the tactic that I want to use for this problem is to figure out the equation in factored form first and then do some distribution, do some multiplying out to get it into standard form, right? I think that's the best course of action. I don't even know if it's really that possible to find a standard form just by looking at the graph. Maybe it is. I don't know how to do it though. So we are going to think about factored form first. And the important thing about factored form is that we know the zeros, right? Factored form, the whole point of it is to tell us what are the values of x that turn the equation into zero. Well, I can see that on this graph, I have three times that I cross the x-axis, or three zeros, right? They happen here, here, and here. That just happens to be at x equals negative two, uh, x equals one, and x equals three, right? These are my three um, x-intercepts, and those mean that in the equation, right, these are the values that I plug into my equation to make the output zero. 
That means in the parentheses, right, when we're writing the factored form, you're actually gonna write the opposite, right? X equals negative two is the point, which means that in the equation, it's X plus two, right? If X is the thing, if negative two is the thing that makes it zero, well then in the equation, it has to be that thing plus two, right? Negative two plus two is zero. And then for this one as well, it's gonna be the opposite, X minus one, and then X minus three, right? And if we just jam those all together, then we have factored form, which means that let's call it f of x, our function is equal to just x plus two times x minus one times x minus three. And that is our factored form equation, okay? It's worth noting, just like on the previous problems to check the end behavior. Now this one has three roots, right? Um, and it looks like a, a what is it, a cubic function, a third degree function. In fact, the one that I wrote is a third degree, which means it's odd, which means I can think about the end behavior like a line, like a linear function, right? And if I go from end to end and draw a line between them, I can see that this looks like a more complicated line, right? It's a line that someone stretched out right here and stretched down right there. But really the end behavior is the same where this looks like a linear line with a positive slope. Right. This is an odd degree function with this specific end behavior. That means that it's a positive uh, initial leading value, right? Which would mean if I had to put something here, maybe it would be negative, right? If it was going down this way, it would be negative, but in this case it's positive. So I don't even actually have to put a number there because the existence of a number implies positive one. Um, so there's a positive one in front of everything, right? So there's already a positive one there, so I don't need to write it. All right, so now our job is to do the second part of this problem, which is to write it in standard form. We have the factor form, let's write it in standard form, okay? Here's what I recommend. We're gonna wanna distribute this out um, and make it look like a um, cubic function with like an x cubed plus something x squared and so on. Um, and I'm gonna do that just by multiplying uh, and distributing the different binomials, right? These little tiny parentheses together. And I'll start by just choosing the first two. If I can just multiply these two together and figure out what this polynomial would be, right? This is gonna be a quadratic. I'm just gonna multiply then x minus three to it, all right? So you've probably done this a couple of ways. We've seen it with the area model. Um, and so if I wanna do the area model, first thing I'll need to do is I realize I'm multiplying a two term, it's a binomial, right? Two term thing and a two term thing. That means I need a two by two area model to help me multiply them out. Uh, let me draw it bigger actually. Let me give myself a little more space. Two by two. And I'm going to, on the edges, it's kind of just like factoring a little bit, but we're actually, it's like the opposite of factoring actually. We're gonna multiply it out. I'm gonna write, my, uh, it's not a two, it should be a one, right? X minus one. I'm just taking, oh no, it erased everything. All right, I'm just taking the first term, right? X plus two and putting that on the edges here, X plus two. And then this term right here is X and minus one. And then everything on the inside of the boxes will just be these things, the edges multiplied together, like a Punnett square, right? So it's gonna be X times X is X squared. Um, X times two is gonna be two X. X times negative one, well, that's negative X and negative one times two, that is negative two, all right? Now, one cool trick is that you're gonna have to do um, some combining like terms. There will always be two terms that are similar. Um, and that, those are always gonna be the ones that are adjacent like this, right? If you set it up right, it will be adjacent like that. So I can rewrite this if I combine like terms as, well, I only have one x squared here, but I have a two x minus x. That leaves me with just the single x plus x, and then a minus two. Okay, and that, this whole thing is this, right? I just multiply this out, which means my second step now, if I wanna rewrite this in standard form, is I'm gonna take this now, this po polynomial, x squared plus x minus two, which once again is the same thing as this, and I'm gonna multiply it by x minus three, right? Which means I need a new area model. I'm gonna set it up like I'll do a, three by two, I guess, or two by three. I actually don't know when, which one's which. Do you normally start with the width or the length? Can't tell, I need to make it bigger too. Uh, like this, like this, and like this, there we go. I need two spaces for my X minus three, all right, this thing right here. And then I need three spaces 
So I'll split into thirds for all the things here, the x squared plus x and the minus two, right? And now everything that I fill into this is gonna be just the product of the edges, right? So x times x squared, well, that's gonna give me x cubed. x squared times negative three is negative three x. x times, or x squared, sorry. x times x is x squared. x times negative three is negative three x. x times negative two is negative two x. And negative two times negative three is six, positive six, right? And so then, same thing, the two sort of kitty corners here are going to be the like terms, and I'm going to want to combine them. And so, uh, where should I take this? I want to write it like here, but I guess that's okay. Um, and now what I'm going to do is just write my final answer, which is going to be this whole inside of my area model, but with my like terms combined, right? So it's going to give me an x cubed, which is by itself. It's going to give me... Um, x squared minus 3x, well, I'll leave me with minus 2x squared, and then minus 2x minus 3x, that's negative 5x, and then we're left with a plus 6. And guess what? This answer right here is, in fact, the standard form version of this factored form version. So these are my two answers. This is the factored form, the first thing we figure it out. And then to turn it into standard form, I just multiplied it out like this. And I end up with this cubic function. All right. I'm going to leave you four to do by yourself. I think you can figure this one out. All right. This one might be a little more tricky, but not necessarily. Um, the only thing you want to think about this one, I'll give you a little tip on this one, is think about the leading coefficient. All right. Think about the leading coefficient. You're going to see that this polynomial is a specific type of degree. Wait, I wrote co-effing. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> co- What was I even saying? Oh, I, I looked at leading again, and I just kept writing. and Coefficient. I think that's how you spell it. I have no clue. Think about the leading coefficient of this one, right? If I were to categorize this shape as a positive or negative shape, right? Think about it as it's as it's going from place to place. What am I doing, um, especially on the tail ends, right? Where am I going? Think about what that will change to the equation. So give four a try. It's going to be super similar to this one, right? Find the zeros first and then write out that factored form and then um, go ahead and just multiply that out. Now, it's worth assuming, you know, all these, every time I cross it zero, just apply that. It's multiplicity one, right? All right, number five. I like this problem a lot. Sorry, it's so tiny. Let me, let me see if I can do a little little job of making it bigger. Oh my gosh. Let me give me some straight lines here. That's a straight line. That's a straight line. Get that over there. Enhance. We're going to go. All right. So there's this function again. We are prompted. The question we have is explain whether or not the following function could be a fifth degree function, right? We're not saying that it necessarily is, we're just saying it could, right? Notice I don't give you any labels whatsoever. I give you no numbers, I give you no multiplicities, no equation. So you gotta use some deductive reasoning to figure it out, all right? And the way to figure out this is kind of like the one we did with the degree on the first problem, right? We wanna think about what is the possible degrees, oh, where am I going? What are the possible degrees that this weird polynomial shape could have? Okay. Well, I know that it is, you know, implied that the multiplicities of zeros directly relates to the degree of the function. Okay. And so when I look at this, I can see that I have actually two zeros here. I have a zero here and a zero here. All right. Now, once again, I didn't give you any scale. So I know that this visually might look like you know, you might be able to tell what the multiplicities are, but throw that out the window, right? Math is one of these things where if I don't tell you the specifics, you have to assume anything is possible, right? And so what we're gonna do here is think about what are the multiplicities at the zeros that I can see, right? What are the multiplicities at the zeros I can see? Well, I can see that this one here has an even multiplicity because it bounces, right? It's clearly bouncing. I'm not crossing through the axis, I am bouncing off of it. And this one here, has an odd 
multiplicity. Okay. This one has an odd multiplicity because it's cutting through, right? It's crossing through. Well, the ways that something can bounce or the ways that something can cross can be any combination of even and odd multiplicities, right? And what we've learned and, and one thing I've talked about is that as you have an odd multiplicity function, you like the greater your odd multiplicity, the weirder like you squiggle or wiggle through the line. Well, that's easy to tell with odds, but for evens, it's actually really hard to tell what the multiplicity of an even thing is. It has to just do with the width of how you bounce off of it, right? But really that's determined by the scale of the graph, okay? So really what you wanna think about is, to answer a problem like this, to answer could this be a fifth degree function? Well, the first way to think about it is, is there a combination, is there a way that I could have an even multiplicity here added with an odd multiplicity to make up a total of fifth degree? And I think there is, right? I think that this could very easily you know, I'm not saying it necessarily is. Once again, we're asking if it could be. This could be a fourth degree uh, or a fourth multiplicity, like something raised to the fourth power. Or I don't know, a fourth's not the best thing. It could be a, a multiplicity of four, right? The way I bounce off of this, because it just has to be even number. And this could be a multiplicity of one. And if I say that this is four, right? Every The multiplicities of my zeros added up is my degree four plus one is five. And so because I would say that this could be, yes, this could be, because the multiplicities of the zeros could add up to five. Right, we have one even zero and one odd multiplicity zero, okay? Another cool thing to see is that we have some imaginary roots and what's cool about imaginary roots, they always come in pairs, right? And so even if we assumed that this was a second degree or a multiplicity two, this could also, these uh, like imaginary roots could also add to our degree, which would make it possible to be degree five, right? But this could be a degree five function because there is a combination of even numbers like four plus odd numbers like one that add up to five, right? This could also be like two and three maybe. You know, really all you're saying is this could be because the multiplicities of the zeros could add up to five. It's also worth noting that we could figure this out just on its end behavior, right? I know that odd degree functions have end behavior that either starts at the top and goes down to the bottom like this, or starts at the bottom and goes down to the, at the top like that, or goes up to the top. This one does that, right? This one has an end behavior that looks like an odd degree function with a negative leading coefficient, which would mean that this is a possibility of being a fifth degree function. Okay, so there's a couple ways to explain it. I would say, yes, this could be because the multiplicity of the zeros could add to zero, and it's clearly, it's an odd degree function by its end behavior. Both of those things together imply that it could be a fifth degree, all right? Let's look at this one, though. Let's explain whether or not this function could be a fifth degree function, okay? Well, when I look at this graph, and I'll make this one bigger as well, real quick. Give, give, me a, give, me a, give me a straight line. Ooh, that's not a straight line. Give me a straight line. Give me a straight line. And then give me a, a little shoo. Don't hit the zero. Ooh, 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 yeah. That's pretty good, honestly. I'm proud of myself. Well, uh, watch this. Hey, that's pretty good. No, that's, that's pretty good. Okay. Well, when I look at the zeros of this one, however, I only ever touch or bounce across the x-axis one time and it's right here, right? And I'm bouncing, which means this has to be an even multiplicity zero. And it's the only zero that I see, right? It's the only real zero that's on this graph. If the only real zero has an even multiplicity, well, five isn't an even number. Five is not an even number, it's odd, right? is not an even odd, I was gonna write. It's not an even number, 
which means if the multiplicities are only even, right? If the degree of this function only is con like made up of zeros with even multiplicities, there's no possible way that I could add it up to five. And so it cannot be, it cannot be, no, right? Because the multiplicities do not add up to five or cannot add up to five. Multiplicities cannot add to five, right? There's also one more way to tell, and it's by the end behavior again, right? You have a couple ways to think about how to prove this one wrong, the end behavior. This one, this graph does not look like a line, right? I can't take one tail and draw it up to the next tail, which means that this is clearly an even degree function. Um, just by looking at, if I were to draw this and make this a parabola, right, it would have this end behavior. Parabolas are the simplest even degree function. Every more complicated even degree function is just a more complicated parabola in essence. And so what ends up happening is this end behavior is not possible for an odd degree function. End behavior not possible for an odd degree function, which means since the thing we want, a fifth degree function is odd, um, you know, it's not even a number, it's odd. This could not be a fifth degree function. The end behavior is not possible for an odd degree, so it can't be fifth. Right? This one's cool, because you kind of have to prove it. Like, you have to tell me why or why not. And there's multiple ways you can think about it. You can do the zeros and the multiplicities. You can do the end behavior. If you know more about the imaginary roots, you can talk about that as well, right? There's a lot of different aspects to tackle these types of problems. But really what's important is that you um, can just like analyze the different like key characteristics that make something possible as an odd or an even degree function, right? All right, seven. This one's saying sketch a polynomial graph with the following characteristics, okay? So I've given you three zeros. I've given you a zero at x equals negative one, and x at or x equals two, and x equals three with a multiplicity of two. Okay, I want to say that there's infinite possible answers for this one. This also has a positive leading coefficient, um, and it has an absolute minimum at negative zero point one zero six comma negative eighteen point one six three. I'm gonna give you a little secret, okay? I'm gonna, let, me tell, let me tell you a little secret. These numbers are purposefully complicated. The reason, the reason that we gave you some complicated numbers is to think about where this point is. Where is this point? All right? Well, this point has a negative x value and a negative y value. The part of the coordinate plane that has a negative x value and a negative y value is in quadrant three, this one on the bottom left, which means that somewhere along the way, we have to hit the points like this. We need to hit x equals negative one. Let's say that's like right here. Okay, let's say that's x equals negative one. We need to hit x equals two, like right here. And we need to hit x equals three, like right here. Don't worry about your scale. It doesn't have to be perfect. And uh, let me worry about it a little bit, actually. Let me make one over here. There's negative one. It's gonna, this is gonna drive me mad if I don't. All right, so I have these three zeros, right? My zero at negative one, my zero at two, and my zero at three. Okay, I also am given that the multiplicity of two is at, or this zero right here at three has a multiplicity of two, which means I wanna bounce off of this one. These ones I think I'm gonna have to cross through. Okay, so I might write a little C to help me out there. Um, and then I need to hit a point, this like weird ass point, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this weird point in uh, quadrant three, which is like right here. <laughs> Uh, I'm not gonna edit this video. If you made it this far, hey, you get to hear me say the A word, dude. Um, and then it also has a Y intercept at negative 18. Let's say that's like right here, okay? So I just need to draw a line that goes through all of these things. I'm kind of doing one of these like cool little, uh, you know, sketch -a graph things, I don't know. Anyway, I need to hit. This has an absolute minimum. Um, oh wait, this is, such a bad spot. If this is the minimum, if this is the y value, then it's like way down here. Sorry, this minimum's got to be like this. Okay, um, which means I'm gonna move this back just a little bit. Let me just give myself some room. Okay, so I need to hit just all of these points, and I want to think about the way that I can do that. Well, first of all, I know that this is an absolute minimum. 
which means there's no lower point than this. So it it can't be reasonable for me to start drawing my graph down here. That just, that just can't be a fact, right? Because that would mean my line exists below the absolute minimum, which is not possible. And so I need to start my graph from up top, okay? What I'm gonna do is think about the ways that I can cross through these zeros and hit the minimum here, the y-intercept, and then everything else I need to hit, okay? And here's what's gonna happen. It's gonna look like this. I know that I need to start from up here, and so I'm gonna work my way down and cross through the zero at negative one, and then I'm gonna hit my absolute minimum at this point, you know, whatever they told me it was at, bounce back up, cross through my y-axis for my y-intercept, and then I'm gonna hit this point right here, okay? And I've reached a fork in the road because I can actually decide what I wanna do at this point, or maybe I have some other options. Let me redraw this a little bit nicer, okay? But right now what I need to think about as well is that I was given the fact that this has a positive leading coefficient, all right? If I think about these degrees, let's assume this is a multiplicity one rather, not degrees, but multiplicity. And then this one is a multiplicity one, means I'm crossing through it. But this one has a multiplicity of two. That means that I have an even degree function, right? One plus one plus two, the multiplicities. That means if I want a positive leading coefficient, I know that my NBA end behavior has to be over here, and then I also have to end over here, right? It needs to be up like a cup, this whole shape. So what that means is, since I know I have to bounce off of this and come back up here, somewhere in between again, between this zero at positive two and my zero at three, I need to change direction, okay? And so overall, this is my line. This is the line that I get. Looks like this, right? which fits all of these criteria. It has zeros at negative one, two, and three. It hits this absolute minimum at the weird point, negative 0 0.1 comma negative 18.2 or whatever it is, right? It hits my y-axis at negative 18, which was my y-intercept, and it hits the zeros that I was going, and it has a positive leading coefficient because if I look at my end behavior thing right here, it looks like this, right? It looks like an upward facing shape um, and on both ends, I'm going up. So this works, nice. Right. This one you gotta get creative, right? You have to think about all the different ways that you can hit these things and then just fit it all together until it works, right? Until you've hit all of these different uh, components. If you wanna give yourself a little check mark to make sure you hit everything, it might be good, okay? But this would be your answer. All right, we're on the last problem, which we have six examples of. Um, and what's cool about this is it's kind of a combination of the one we just did and then the fifth degree one from the one before it, okay? And so we're gonna analyze and just sort of look at the key features of the, these two graphs. They look a little complicated, but I think we can tackle it. And what we wanna do is think about where are the zeros, first of all, and then we wanna think about things like end behavior, which would then imply leading coefficient, right? If any of the equations on the right-hand side like don't match up with what we found from the graph, then it can't be one of the functions that could model it, right? So we're just trying to figure out, and we, we don't have to explain anything, we're just trying to select which ones could work, and uh, maybe you give those a green check mark, and you maybe you cross out the ones that can't work, okay? So let's take a look at this function right here, okay, this A. Well, just like we've been talking about with end behavior, and this is why this is so crucial, that, that segment, that sort of tangent I did in problem one, Feeling like getting a grasp of that end behavior is really important for these problems because I can immediately see just by the fact that both of these ends are heading down as I go to the left and go to the right, that this is gonna be an even degree function, right? It just looks like that, right? It's a more complicated problem. I could probably draw something like this. I could stretch these points out to match an arch, right? But either way, the end behavior matches that of an even degree, okay? And so first things first, let's just scan if any of these three, remember this is two different problems. So we have these three that represent this, these three that represent this. Um, any of these that don't have an even degree, okay? If they don't have an even degree, we can just cross them off, all right? So remember degree, degree is simply in factored form, right? Factored form, uh, that's the one that looks like this with a bunch of parentheses. For example, this one is in factored form. This one right here is in factored form. You just add up all the exponents, 
one, two, three, whatever. So the degree in factored form, add the exponents. In standard form, which is like this one, it is the largest exponent of a variable. Of a variable. The largest exponent above a variable, right? So let's take a look at this first one right here, f1 of x, okay? I can see, if I scan through this, I'm looking at, for standard form, the largest exponent, and I can see right here that it's a five, right? This number is a five, which means that if the largest degree, or the largest exponent of a variable is five, that means that this is a degree five polynomial. But wait, we already said five is not an odd, or five is not an even number, it's an odd number. So this one cannot be. This cannot be, right? It's degree five. This one has an even degree, all right? Well, we can also take a look at this one right here, and we can see that it actually does, this number above the three right here is a four, and so this one could possibly work, okay? This one on the bottom, this one, I'm skipping the factor form one for now, but the standard form one, there's a four above the x, is that this one? It could be, maybe. Let's see if we can figure out something that would make it not, all right? Uh, and here's what I would do, all right? So we have a couple different options. First, we need to analyze the end behavior. And so as I look at this graph, this is an even degree function, and both of the tails are pointing down, which would imply that it has a negative leading coefficient. Okay, well, let's check. Do any of these not have a leading coefficient that's negative? No, they're both negative. All right, so that doesn't really help us for this one. So then what we have to think about is what are the zeros, right? What are the zeros that I'm crossing through? Well, I can see that A has a zero right here, has a zero right here, right here, right here where I bounce, and right here, all right? And let's just, like the um, problem that we did uh, which one was it? This one, right? The one where we figured out the degree. Let's just assume every time we cross through that it's a, oops, sorry. Let's assume every time we cross through that it has a multiplicity of one. And every time that we bounce, it has a multiplicity of two. All right. Well, let, then I would look at these and I would say that this has a multiplicity of one because I crossed through. This one has a multiplicity of one because I crossed through. This one has a multiplicity of one because I crossed through. This one bounces, which means that probably has a multiplicity of two, maybe even more. And this one has a multiplicity of one, okay? If I add all those up, if I say one plus one plus one, that's three, plus two is five, plus one is six, okay? So not only is this an even degree function, but the lowest possible degree that it could be, the smallest possible degree that it could be is six, right? This is the lowest even degree that it could be this degree is four. Four is lower than six, which means that this is not possible because this one is at least degree six. And four is not six, all right? So last but not least, let's tackle this factored form one. Can I figure this one out? Well, let's take a look at the zeros, right? It has a negative leading coefficient, which is good, Let's just take a look at where these zeros are. And I'm gonna write a little negative sign if the zero happens in the negative version of the x-axis or the negative side of the x-axis and a little plus sign if it happens on the right side of the x-axis, okay? Uh, or the y-axis, sorry. If it's a positive at zero or negative zero. Well, if I'm adding it into the function, that means that x has to be negative to make it zero. So this one's gotta be negative. This one's gotta be negative. This one's gotta be negative. But these two gotta be positive guess what? If we take a look at this, I have one negative zero here, one negative zero here, one negative zero here, right? All with a multiplicity of one. And they even look spaced out like these ones are. And then this one has one zero with a multiplicity of two where I bounce right there. And then one more where I cross through. Hey, I think this matches up pretty well, right? This pretty much, this has to be the exact same thing as this. Like, come on. So... Um, I'm gonna say that this one definitely could model this graph. This one could model. 
right? The, the zeros just match up. The zeros and the multiplicity and the even, like this is one plus one plus one plus two plus one, that's six. The leading coefficient matches up, the end behavior, everything matches up. I think this one could model, and I think it's actually probably just that function. All right, last three, last three, we can do this. These ones all are in factored form. And so what that means is we have to think about the leading coefficient first and then the degree, okay? Um, and when I look at this graph right here, I can see that I have a zero right here, a zero right here, and a zero right here, okay? Now, the rational roots theorem, the rational roots theorem states that the largest amount of real zeros is equal to the degree, right? The amount of real zeros that a polynomial could have is equal to a degree. We also call this in my class the Feek theorem because Felix came up with this, okay? It's the Feek theorem. Um, and so what we have to think about is, since this only has three zeros, the largest degree that this could be is three. The largest degree that this could be is three. Actually, no, sorry, the smallest degree that this could be is three. Sorry, the smallest degree that this could be is three. Um, no, sorry, the largest degree that this could be is three. <laughs> No, sorry, the, the smallest degree that this could be is three, because these could also have a multiplicity of large number. Anyway, the smallest degree of this that is three. Uh, degree uh, could be three, which implies that it's a odd degree function, right? It's an odd degree function. Um, and in fact, it matches the end behavior of an odd degree function. Um, where if I draw a line from one tail end to the other, I can see that this is a like linear function in essence, which means it has the same end behavior as a linear function. And this looks like a linear function with a positive slope, which would imply that this is a odd degree function with a positive leading coefficient. This is an odd degree function with a positive leading coefficient. I lost my cursor somehow, and I, I don't know where I'm writing, okay? So let's think about what are the ones, if any of these don't have a positive leading coefficient, then it has to be canceled out, right? And if I look at this middle one right away, oh my goodness gracious. If I look at this middle one right away, right? F2 of x, uh, this one does not have a positive leading coefficient, it has a negative. So this one cannot be because it has a negative leading coefficient. Okay. Now the other ones possibly could, right? But this problem, it tells me that there are only zeros right here, right? Oh no, right here. And oh, I can't see my cursor. So I have to like guess where I'm at. All right, right there, right there, and right there right? Those are the only zeros, which means that I should only have three sets of parentheses going on, right? But if I look at F3 of X, I can see that this is telling me I have a zero at negative seven, a zero at negative one, a zero at positive five, and a zero at positive three. That doesn't match up, right? The zeros, uh, zeros do not match up, okay? So F3 of X cannot be either. F2 and F3 of X cannot be. Um, and I wouldn't give you a problem that has a no answers. So, but let's just check, let's just check. This one implies that it has a negative zero right here at negative seven, a zero at negative one, and a zero at positive five. Hey, that kind of matches up. It's got a positive leading coefficient. It's shifted down three, there's just minus three, but don't worry about that, right? This is the transformation. And so this one overall um, could possibly model this function, right? This could possibly model it. The zeros match up, the leading coefficient matches up, everything matches up, even the degree, right? This is one plus one plus one degree if I add up the multiplicities. 
Um, and so this works, all right? So in each one of these, there was one that worked. There might be more, there might be less on the actual test. Um, don't think that just because you found two that didn't work or one that did work that the other ones can't. You should uh, make sure that if you say something cannot be, it has a reason why, all right? So last part of this is just some overall notes to go back through. And um, we also talked about transformations, okay? So I wanna write just the, um, I know I said this, helpful pages in your book. Um, you can use your book if you want, but we've been using a lot of packets like the polynomial packet and the transformation packet. But one thing I wanna go over is just transformations real quick. I got my cursor back. Transformations, okay? Um, and specifically transformations of f of x equals x squared, okay? What's cool about um, this sort of topic of transformations is that it directly relates to our last topic, specifically vertex form, okay? So transformations, you really wanna think about vertex form, if you remember that, which um, as a reference, vertex form was this, f of x, whoa, what did I just do? f of f, f of x equals, um, we have this variable a, right? Our leading coefficient a, a times x minus h, x minus h, oops, I want it in purple, h to the power of two, and then plus k. Uh, let's use pink, right? And anything that you do to a function, any uh, sort of transformations like these ones right here, um, all they would do is shift around the original x squared by doing either something to its concavity, right? Changing its concavity, right? That means if it's up like a cup or down like a frown, it also refers to um, the width of a parabola, right? How wide it is versus how narrow it is, right? The larger the number, the we call this dilation, right? This is the word we use, dilation. Which by the way, no, wait. Oh, there's no A, there's no A in this word. I always write it as dilation. It's not, it's just dilation. It's just dilation. Weirdest thing that's ever happened to me is learning that, dilation. It's a stupid word should be dilation. I mean, it's hard, right? Like, it's hard to not like have this, you know, because L is a retroflex like or a lateral liquid sound, right? If you're thinking linguistically, like you make it in the back of your throat, I is a vowel, it's very hard to not create a diphthong going from a vowel to a lateral liquid, right? So anyway, um, that's why we probably think it's dilation. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, so that's what the A value does. It dilates things or it reflects it, right? It changes the concavity. So you can either reflect or dilate, um, this h value, that's the thing that you add or subtract in the parentheses, that shifts you horizontal, right? If you wanna remember h for horizontal. And just remember that when you add, you actually go left. And when you subtract, you actually go right. Okay, that's really important. And then k is your vertical transformation. Yeah, right, right, k for vertical, I guess. Uh, maybe if you wanna write it as vertical with a k. Uh, but vertical translation, meaning up or down. And this one just plays by the rules. If you add, you go up. Uh, if you subtract, you go down, okay? So if I wanna do this extra example, describe the transformations of this, well, I can see that the three, the bunch of things that are different from just x squared are, I notice I have a negative three in front of this set of parentheses, right? I have a minus four in my parentheses and I have a plus five on the outside, okay? Well, the things that this is gonna do, this negative three, the fact that it's negative means it's gonna reflect, right? It's changing it from up like a cup to being negative like a frown. It's also gonna dilate by a factor of three. That's gonna make it more skinny, right? That means you're gonna, like grow at a faster rate. And so it's uh, maybe a better word to use instead of dilate is compress. If you multiply by a number bigger than one, you're compressing it, right? You're making it more narrow, like we saw in the transformation packet. Um, if you multiply by like a fraction, it's gonna make it wider, all right? Um, but dilate is just the general word we use in math. 
okay? Um, and then this plus four, or this minus four, sorry, on the inside, that's my horizontal. That's gonna be, since I'm subtracting, that's gonna move me to the right four. And then this plus five at the end, that's gonna mean that I am up five. And so describing the transformations, uh, if you wanna write it in a sentence, you could be like this. Um, the transformations are, transformations are colon, um, a compression or dilation by a factor of three, I chose three, I mean, that's the number we're multiplying by, right? There's a vertical reflection. Um, there's a shift, there's a translation rather, right four, and there is a translation down five, all right? Those are all the things that's different. Right, you're just telling me what's different between these, the parent function and this crazy one, and you tell me what each different thing does. All right, what a video. Holy moly. There's a lot to do. And really, I mean, I, I think I went pretty in depth on this. I hope you feel pretty comfortable. I mean, we spent a lot of time on this. Um, I hope that the length of the video doesn't deter you from watching it. Once again, uh, thank you for getting to the end. I mean, if you're here, you know, you might as well leave a like, you might as well subscribe, if you know what I'm saying, share this with a friend. Anyway, um, good luck. Uh, if you're watching this later on down the road, just, you know, coming back to it as review. Hey, what's up? Uh, anyway, have a good night. Uh, have a good day. Have a good morning, wherever you are. And uh, see you later.